Our next speaker is Marlon Bates. Marlon, Marlon is in horticulture. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, our next speaker is Marlon Bates. Marlon Bates is a horticulture agent with Hay State, with Kansas State Research and Extension in Douglas County. He recently joined Hay State Research and Extension after serving as a horticulture specialist for the University of Missouri Extension in Kansas City, Missouri. Marlon has also served as an adjunct professor for Johnson County Community College's Horticultural Sciences Program. In his work in Extension, Marlin works towards strengthening local food systems by assisting specialty crop producers and educating homeowners about fruit and vegetable gardens. He has established and maintained several demonstration gardens focused on food crops in the Midwest, seeking to educate adults as well as youths about the benefits of locally grown food and gardening. Marlin graduated from Kansas State University in 2007 with a Master of Science degree in Horticulture his graduate studies were in vegetable production involving polio disease control of tomato. He's also received his Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture with an emphasis in greenhouse management, along with a minor in business from Hay State in 2005. Today, Marlon will discuss community gardens in the Midwest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in my minutes, I'm lo reset that. I'm not old enough to have an introduction quite that long. So thanks for having me. Hope everybody's doing well. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces. Who likes to grow food crops? All right, well, it's not like community gardens are exclusively for food crops, but a lot of people grow food crops in community gardens. Um, one thing I'll, I kind of want you to take away from this presentation, hopefully something that uh, maybe you just keep in the back of your mind as we're going through it is just a just kind of odd idea of you know what kind of role might you play in a community garden? <coughs> any of you currently playing a role in a community garden of any way? All right, great. So um, there's a lot of different ways that we might find ourselves involved in a community garden. Obviously, you're interested in horticulture, or you're lost, one of the two. Um, <laughs> so I would say one of the things that I really I took away from getting into uh, uh, college, whenever I was getting it, pursuing a degree in horticulture, is you know one of those things that happens is people find that you have an interest in horticulture, and that must mean you know absolutely everything there is to know about horticulture. And so you might find yourself in a position where um, maybe somebody needs your help in the development of a community garden, or maybe you're one of those people who's interested in developing a community garden. So hopefully this will just kind of give you a snapshot or uh, just an idea of at least some of my experiences as it relates to community gardens here in the Midwest. So uh, we're gonna look at why community gardens. We're gonna look at the sort of the purpose that they serve. We'll also look at sort of why people might be in, uh, interested in, in getting involved in a community garden. We'll look at the different types of community gardens. Uh, these things can manifest themselves in many different ways, um, many different purposes that they might serve. So we'll look at an overview of those. We'll kind of look at getting one started. So this is something that I've done on a, on a few occasions. Uh, we'll look at some, some lessons that I've learned, but some general uh, rules of thumb as it relates to getting a community garden started. Of course, there's, with anything, a lot of hurdles. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those, as well as some of the solutions for overcoming those hurdles. Uh, we'll talk, of course, about benefits. And then one thing that, of course, I hold dear to my heart as an extension educator is we'll, we'll talk a little bit about getting an educational piece in, involved in community gardens. So we know that they can serve a lot of different purposes. Community gardens can serve as simply just a place to garden, whether you're interested in growing vegetables, herbs, flowers, whatever it, it might be. That could be for yourself or it could be for somebody else. Um, a lot of times... You know, we think of community gardens simply just as that place where I can go rent a plot. Uh, but whenever we start talking about the different types of community gardens, you'll see that there's many, many other ways that these things can come about. Community building. There's, there's a great purpose for community gardens. I like the idea of remembering that, you know, oftentimes a community garden is as much about community as it is about gardening. Um, a lot of people are, are interested in community gardens because it gives them sort of that sense of back to nature, particularly as it relates to youths, um, although adults benefit from that just as well. Exercise of gardening, there's the whole physiology piece there, and then repurposing unused property. So community gardens can come about simply because there's an opportune 
piece of property that uh, maybe for beautification purposes could tolerate being turned into a garden, or something more productive in the community. So why people participate, obviously people who maybe don't have adequate space or maybe they have the space but it's all shade uh, and, and they've tried year after year to grow a vegetable garden in, in a shady area, realize that maybe something like this would be of use to them. Some people participate in such a garden because they want to contribute to a cause. So maybe one of the, one of the reasons we see community gardens come about is so that a group of people can get together and produce food for a common cause, for the common good, for donation, for instance, and this would be one reason people could get involved. Again, the exercise, uh, the physical piece, community involvement, there's, um, community gardens vary significantly in the amount of involvement that, that can come about from them, uh, but usually, and, and generally speaking, the most successful community gardens that we see are the ones that have a tremendous amount of community involvement for their own education as well as for the education of their children. So a lot of times if you take just the, the sort of community garden where people come to rent a plot, oftentimes you'll find a huge proportion of the people who are renting those plots have small children and they, want, they always bring them on the weekends uh, whenever they're doing the work during the summertime or even during, during the week, I suppose. So a number of different types of community gardens. There's the neighborhood type where you're, you're going and you're renting a plot. Uh, there's youth or school gardens. So as you're probably aware, school gardens are uh, something that are particularly uh, on the rise. A lot more interest in school gardens these days. There's this uh, concept of a communal garden, which is the one where the collaborative effort is all coming together, not for any one particular person's gain, but instead for that uh, common cause. Food pantry gardens are something that we're seeing a lot more in. Whenever I worked at the University of Missouri, uh, we had an individual who was doing quite a bit of work as related to food pantry, uh, food distribution, fresh fruits and vegetables in, in food pantries in Missouri. And uh, that individual actually did a considerable amount of work reaching out to food pantries who had space so that they could start a community garden so that the people who were benefiting from the pantry could come and help garden and that would sort of help increase the supply of fresh fruits and vegetables that went into that pantry. Therapy gardens, oftentimes, uh, if, if you're familiar with horticultural therapy, you'll see uh, all kinds of sensory gardens or meditation gardens that can be considered <laughs> as community gardens because they are a community asset. And then, of course, there are demonstration gardens. And, and this is the one that I really, uh, I think, mostly put in terms of my experiences, this is where this is where my experience has been, is in the demonstration side. So that's not to say that you know, every community garden should just, or uh, I'm sorry, that community gardens should serve just the purpose of demonstration, because obviously they're going to serve other purposes. Hopefully, with any success, there's going to be at least some food generated off of them, if they're for food. Um, but demonstration is uh, oftentimes something that you'll see at least a component within a garden. So uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the Platte County Community Garden. My office used to be up by the airport, and we helped uh, put this garden together. And there are um, about 10% of the plots that are in there are for demonstration purposes. And so people who garden there, people who rent plots for their families can have to walk by those every time they go to the garden. They have the opportunity to learn something, hopefully, whenever they see that. The pictures here uh, are in the Ivanhoe neighborhood at 37th in Woodland, Kansas City, Missouri, before and after. So this was just a vacant lot. We took the opportunity uh, to beautify, but also took the opportunity to demonstrate and educate to people who lived around there what, it, what it, this might look like. So if you took a vacant lot and turned it into a community garden, this is, this is what it could look like. We also took the opportunity to bring those individuals in, make sure that they saw it and uh, were a part of the development of that, which is kind of what this slide is all about. So one of the things I think is that's incredibly important is if you have an interest in seeing a community garden in your neighborhood, for instance, or if somebody says, well, I'd really like to, to create a community garden, can you, can you give me some help? One of the things you have to take into consideration is that success with these things takes intention. You have to deliberately go out and make sure that you're doing the things that need to be done to see success. And I think the first and foremost thing is, 
It's got to be sort of a grassroots effort. Does that make sense? The people who are going to benefit from that garden need to be involved from day one. So this drawing down here at the bottom doesn't happen without the input from the people who are going to be benefiting from this garden, whether that's participating as, as somebody who's renting a plot or um, somebody who's going to be in that, who lives in that neighborhood where you're, you're trying to demonstrate uh, what a vacant lot turned community garden looks like. The key here is, is buy-in, making sure that the people who are going to benefit are bought in. And that's not, that's not something that I think I, could, I can highlight enough um, because I've seen the alternative where you know, a good-hearted person came or a group of people came in, established a community garden because that's what they thought the right thing was, uh, and then nobody particularly liked it. And nobody came around and patronized it. Nobody signed up to help because it wasn't theirs. So we have a, I had the same colleague I was telling you about that did the work with the food pantries, put up a, a publication called the Community Garden Toolkit, which is incredibly valuable. He highlights in there 10 steps to success. So as I mentioned, making sure that people in the community are bought in is number one. Get a meeting together, have everybody get together so that you can see if there's even interest. What, at all, uh, but also if there is interest, what kind of interest? Locating the appropriate space. This is something that, you know, uh, either, either having the appropriate space is what's driving the meeting or the desire to have a garden is driving the meeting. And if it's just the de desire to have the meeting, um, to have the garden that's getting people together and you don't know where the space is, this is something that can take a pretty significant amount of time. So in the example of the Platte County Community Garden, uh, there was six of us that got together. And it was about a year and a half before we had a signed agreement with our organizations, members of the community, and the landowner. Uh, a year and a half. And, and we looked at a lot of different properties, um, many of which would have been great if there would have been water anywhere nearby. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, the necessary step of having yet another meeting, because oftentimes that first meeting is sort of breaking up people and figuring out what it is that they're particularly interested in as it relates to the development of this. Uh, so uh, groups might get assigned certain tasks, for instance. So a second meeting oftentimes is necessary to, to kind of start thinking about uh, what, are, what are some of the things that you found out whenever you were out in the community, or where are the properties that you identified where a landowner might be okay with us coming in and, and installing a community garden. Uh, securing the property, of course, you want to, if you're going to be putting in an effort, and we'll take a look at what kind of effort it takes, you want to make sure that it's not something that the property is just going to get pulled right out from underneath you six weeks later. At minimum a year, preferably five years, would be a little bit more reasonable. Planning the site. So this is actually where the fun starts. So you might consider looking for property fun. Uh, or agonizing, depending on what kind of experience you have. In my opinion, planning the site is, is probably the, the most fun because you get to start, this is where all the daydreams come and, and get put on paper. Uh, but this is also kind of a strenuous point because hopefully you've got that community buy-in. In order to get that buy-in, you got people of all different walks of life, different sorts of experiences who probably want different things, but you have to get them all together on the same page. So oftentimes having somebody from the outside, like you or I, somebody who maybe isn't as vested, uh, involved in this part of the discussion is, is pretty beneficial because you have somebody who's, who's not uh, seeing it in the same light. And they can sort of serve as that individual who uh, at least can, can help make that discussion go forward as opposed to not. Guidelines is something that is particularly important. In this publication, the Community Garden Toolkit, uh, there's actually a, a gardener's welcome packet. So if you're interested in getting into a community garden or if somebody asks you, you can point them to this resource. Not only does it go through these 10 steps in greater detail than we're covering here today, but it also provides sort of a welcome packet or uh, sort of a aggregation of rules uh, that, you, that we've seen in community gardens across the country. So we did a, an evaluation of you know, what, what, are what are the rules that people have? You know, uh, 
Maybe some of that is communal time. That you have to spend time, you know, working in the common areas so that, so that things are kept up, um, making sure that things are relatively weed free and that things are you know, relatively disease and insect free so that you, you're not contributing to a larger problem throughout the entire community garden. How do you get there? So you can just Google or look up MU Extension Community Garden Toolkit. I will send, uh, actually the last page has a couple of websites for you. Preparing and developing the site. Uh, this is the most exciting, maybe not the most fun, but the most exciting part, depending on how large of a community garden you're, you're attempting to establish. And then finally, once it's all said and done, you got everybody signed up, you celebrate your success. So let's, I'm not going to go through all those with a bunch of pictures, but I just want to give you an idea of what all might be involved. So this is the Platte County Community Garden. This is on 45 Highway. Uh, you'll notice a beautiful golf hole off to the right. Um, so we had a, a, a good landowner who was willing to let us uh, come in. There used to be a lot of berms right in there, so it was not level. This had Bermuda grass that was about two feet tall, probably. Thickest, thickest stuff I've ever walked in. If you can avoid putting a community garden on well-established Bermuda grass, <laughs> I would recommend it because we've been fighting it, at least on the east end, for several years. You'll notice the bulldozer. We don't own a bulldozer. No, none of us owned a bulldozer. But there was a guy who was uh, dozing some property about two miles east of there, stopped by one day, said, hey, what's going on? Try to get to know you for just a minute, because we've got some work for you to maybe do. And he came over with a big smile on his face, and he did all that work for free. So there's a key. Find, find people to do that kind of, if, if earthwork has to be done, that was huge for us. Otherwise, we would never have been able to do this, this project. It would have been dead before it even got started. So, uh, and at least he says he moved all the good soil off to the side, then leveled it, and then moved the good soil back. I'm not real sure that he did that. Uh, I think everybody says that, don't they? But whether, that, whether or not they actually do might be a different story. We have, uh, we have a volunteer here who came through uh, and broke, broke up the soil. On the back end, he's got a bucket on the front that he actually started to uh, bring in piles uh, or spread the mulch around. So this is a good picture, if you can see at all. Um, the landowner put up a fence for us because there's a pretty big deer population there. Uh, we did find out that the, the fence wasn't small animal proof, but yeah, we didn't get any deer in there. Um, but you'll see all those flags. So we went through and, and we marked every single plot. So we decided a, a 10 foot by 20 foot plot was gonna be probably about as, as good as we could do. So that would give us about 33 plots. We, have, we figured there's enough demand for 33. We wanted a few for demonstration education purposes. The guys at the fire station wanted a couple. The landowner wanted a couple. So, you know, we had 24, 25 to get rid of. And um, when the day came, there was a line that was about 30 people long. So there was five people that didn't get a plot. Within five minutes, every single plot was sold. Now, uh, it was interesting talking about what size of a plot. I mean, honestly, is 10 by 20 a decent sized plot? Would you? What do you think? Too big? Too small? Too small? Too big? Huh? Depends on what you charge, maybe, I don't know. So one of the, we, we, were, we weren't worrying about what we were gonna charge, but what was interesting was when we were having this discussion was, uh, I mean, well, obviously we had the dimensions of what, what we had to work with, and we knew that the highway was getting ready to be expanded, so that was gonna affect us. But uh, there was a lady who was a part of our group whose son lived in France. Well, in France, everybody gets quarter acre. And she's like, 10 foot by 20 foot, what are you, crazy? We should, you know. That's 200 square feet. We need at least like 10,000. I was like, oh, now you're crazy because this isn't France. I wish we could have done that, but we would have had one plot, you know. And they, build, they build buildings and, and, and they have wine cellars, you know, underneath their gardens, uh, which makes me want to just move to France. So we also uh, got, got in good with our Parks and Rec. So they're interested in seeing this kind of stuff, too. 
Uh, this isn't on Parks property, and n none of us work for, for the Parks Department, but we talked to him about it, and uh, we, we knew that we were going to put in a flagstone patio. We got grant money to do it. And so they came through and excavated and helped us move large pallets of flagstone around uh, with their bobcat. Mulch day was a blast. So uh, the tractor you saw earlier had the bucket. So we had all the flags in. So this was just a blank slate. We had all these flags in. If you looked at it just right, you could see that where the rectangles were. And you knew in between the rectangles, we needed a whole bunch of mulch. So we started moving mulch around. We moved mulch for about nine hours that day, mostly by hand after it got delivered from one end. Um, but we probably had 15 truckloads of mulch dropped. And you just talk to the tree care companies and they, they'll drop it for free. They were happy to drop it. Lots and lots and lots of work. So that's, that's a, a terrible amount of work, but done correctly and done with buy-in of the community, we had great success. Some of the things I think that are worth pointing out as it relates to common hurdles, group decisions, kind of alluded to this idea that getting everybody on board with the same uh, plan is, is oftentimes difficult. Um, water access definitely got to be at the top of your list if you're looking for a piece of property. Uh, and then the affordability of it, obviously that's going to be an on, ongoing cost. And figuring out what your price point is per plot, if it's one of those gardens, uh, to, cover the afford to cover the cost of water can be pretty tricky because oftentimes you're, you're just taking a stab in the dark and hoping that you have enough. Common area maintenance. This is something we kind of alluded to. You can, you can sort of put this in check. You think you can by uh, you know, putting some sort of requirement uh, for, the garden, for the gardeners who are, who are renting. Management. So community gardens are, in, are very management intensive. So they're maintenance intensive as it relates to the common areas, for sure. But they're certainly management intensive, too, if, if people are renting a plot. So you've got to have committed people who are willing to sort of be the, the uh, torchbearers as it relates to making sure that all the rules are being followed, all the plots are getting sold, maintaining a, and creating a, a waiting list if necessary, uh, and doing all of that other stuff. So if there's an agency that's willing to do that, that's, that's nice for somebody who, if they can take it on. Otherwise, if it has to be a volunteer, then you have to almost put, put a little board together so that it, it, it gets covered. Participation can be an issue, right? We kind of know this about gardening, like a lot of everybody's really excited about it in, in April and May, and maybe even into June, but maybe not so much in July and August. Um, and when you have other people's gardens that could be affected by a lack of maintenance in other people's plots. This can become an issue. Uh, and then theft and vandalism. So I haven't really seen much vandalism. Um, I've seen my fair share of theft, uh, but mostly in, in gardens that are designed to grow food for donation. So you could consider that theft if you wanted to, or you could ignore it, because if people are stealing food, they probably need it. So, Really, I'd say the, the main thing about getting around these hurdles is communication, making sure that there's clear expectations that are set, making sure that everybody understands you know, what's expected of them, and having that clearly communicated. Regular organizational meetings, I think, is, is incredibly helpful um, as it relates to making sure people are aware of what their expectations are or what's expected of them, uh, and then enforcement of those expectations. So, you know, you start with a nice letter that says, hey, oh, did you go on vacation? Because we noticed nobody's been around for three weeks or something. Uh, and then say, you know, we can help. There's a group of people here. You know, we can help if you're gone. And if the, if the answer is, oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get back on it, and then that's great because you've, you've successfully done a, a good job of getting somebody back in check without being confrontational. Uh, but then maybe that second or third letter starts to get a little bit more, more aggressive where... You know, if, if you're just going to give up, you need to let us know so that we can do something with your plot so that it doesn't contribute to a larger problem. And, of course, external assistance, you know, going outside of the group to find assistance where it might be needed to help with some of these hurdles, like the water, for instance. Lots of benefits, you might imagine. 
Uh, we kind of talked about this as it relates to you know, why people participate or what sorts of purposes do community gardens serve. Um, we like to think they increase the quality of life of the people who participate, at least in April, May, and June, right? Um, improved access to fresh fruits and vegetables. This, these things can also serve as sort of a launching pad for other community activities. Um, hopefully, they do beautify neighborhoods as opposed to uh, become sort of eyesores. Uh, green space can be good or bad. If it's well maintained, it can be a great thing. Uh, and then charitable giving. Hopefully at least some portion of any community garden has uh, some charitable giving. One of the things we, we took to mind whenever we put together a community garden for people to rent was we went and found the closest pantry and made that as, as known as possible so that if folks weren't able to consume all the produce that came off their plot. They knew exactly where the closest pantry was. It was more than willing to take it. One of the things I think, of course, I told you earlier that is uh, very near and dear to my heart is making sure that we incorporate education. Um, so we did this youth gardening program, and this kid actually came two years in a row. Uh, this was his second year, so you, you would think he would know better. But uh, this is actually a bell pepper that he's holding. It has a leaf on it, but it's covered in mold. So you do the education they may or may not learn, right? Um, great, great kid, though. Um, one of the things I think is very nice about incorporating education is it sort of serves as a purpose for getting the group together, for having that organizational meeting so that you can discuss whatever issues there might be or whatever uh, common space plans there might need to be made for the upcoming year. Um, and then I, I really believe if you're doing education in a community garden that, that incorporating that youth piece really needs to be a part of it. So the idea here is to have a community garden that is representative of uh, the people that are participating in it, representative of the community in every way, shape, and form, and that's, that includes youth. And if you've never done youth education gardening, you're missing an entirely beautiful thing. I even thought that before I had kids. So I'm just going to share some pictures with you. Uh, this is a community garden in Gladstone that we, we put together. Uh, we had a great time. This was just 40 by 40. So we had 10 plots. Each kid had their own plot, or, or they would double up if we had more kids. They were like 12 foot by 8 foot. So they weren't huge, but they were manageable. We had a lot of volunteers, a lot of adults that were helping us. Um, planting day was a, a tremendous amount of fun because all the kids got incredibly excited. Um, there's, there were some rabbits that were near this garden, so that was kind of double-edged sword, I guess. It was fun to see the rabbits, but you knew what they were doing. We'd do fun stuff like the lasagna garden. Um, just make sure that we have space to do this kind of stuff. So if you're, if you're part of a community garden organizing group, make sure that there's that space so that you can do stuff like this. Or that uh, it's, a, it's more lasagna garden. Um, you know, I'm just standing back there, not even paying attention. The Three Sisters TP, make sure there's room for this kind of stuff because the kids love this. Teamwork is built, not only that, but they get the science knowledge, they get to know where their food's coming from, and for some kids they get to know what a fresh fruit or vegetable tastes like. Um, and they, they make uh, great relationships, they make good friends out of something like this because a, 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 I'm sorry, a garden grows all summer long. And so you can engage children all summer long. Um, one thing that I'm just going to wrap up this discussion with is about corporate gardens. So some of you may know uh, about 18 Broadway. Has anybody ever been to 18 Broadway? So here you have a corporation who's interested in putting in a community garden, uh, among other things. They've got you know, a rain garden around the perimeter. They've got sustainable energy demonstration. But a large part of what happens at 18 Broadway is food production. This same corporation has another garden downtown uh, that has 48 raised beds. There's about 120 raised beds at 18 Broadway. Uh, and all the food is donated. So uh, it's, it's a place for people to volunteer. So employees of that corporation or community members or uh, uh, employees of other corporations downtown volunteer at these gardens and do pretty pretty amazing stuff. If you've never been there, you know where the Kaufman found, or the I'm sorry, the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts is right at uh, Broadway and about 16th. So 18 Broadway would be at 18th in Broadway. 
Uh, awesome place. You almost can't hardly see it from Broadway. You really need to stop by sometime and walk through it because it's, uh, it's quite a piece. But this kind of shows you another side of community gardening. Um, we actually, Ariel has helped me out uh, for the last, well, last year. We worked together at this site. And uh, this site alone generated about 4,000 pounds of food. And this is one of those sites where, you know, everything's being produced for donation. And there was probably a pretty tremendous amount of theft. So we know that there was 4,000 pounds, but there was probably more like five or 6,000 that actually was generated off that site. We were able to donate 4,000 of it. That never bothered me because I knew whoever was taking it was taking it because they needed it. But a lot of really cool stuff here. So think of 120 raised beds and what kind of experience you could have just walking through that. And you can walk through there, get some really good ideas. Uh, what's cool about this place is most of those raised beds are single crop. So there's a bed of beets and a bed of eggplant behind it. Or maybe, yeah, that's beets, I think. Uh, I mean, every time we would harvest eggplant, we'd get like 40 pounds of eggplant. I'm glad to hear somebody say nice and not yuck. Uh, so we would, we would have a tremendous amount of food uh, very, very regularly. We also, up, up, up top though, there's a demonstration area where there, it's not necessarily like production, like ma massive production, where we're, the goal there is to kind of show what you could do in a raised bed. So hopefully there's you know, 10 or 11 different things going on in, in each raised bed up top. Really cool site. A lot of people are interested in this sort of uh, corporate giving, uh, corporate uh, volunteerism. And so this is another opportunity. So if you find yourself involved in a conversation as it relates to uh, community gardens, whether it's one that you've initiated or one that somebody found out you know something about horticulture so you must know how to start up a community garden, uh, hopefully you'll get some, some good resources out of this, but, but if not, uh, through the websites. This is one of my favorite pictures, Parsley Worm. What do you, what do you think of that, Ray? <laughs> so uh, my office, as mentioned, and as abundantly clear as my purple shirt, is uh, in Douglas County, Kansas now. We have a website that kind of goes through a lot of this stuff and, and highlights a lot of these important practices called douglascountycommunitygarden.com. But remember that MU Extension publication uh, the Community Garden Toolkit, and uh, it's sort of accompanying piece, which is the Gardener's Welcome Packet. That kind of is a, a blank slate and a, um, sort of editable sheet of rules and, and regulations, what contract, if you will, for participating gardeners. That's all I have. Does anybody have questions? Do we have a minute for questions? Okay. If you have the site and you have water delivered and you're effectively ready to go, um, all you have to do is organize the community piece and maybe do the mulch day or whatever. Maybe you have to draw it out still. I, I think you can pull it off in, in four or five months. You may be able to do it a little bit faster than that, but I, I hesitate to make you think you could do it in a couple of months because of the deliberateness that has to be gone through in terms of creating the uh, sort of the, that grassroots effort. You have to, if you don't get that, then you're not, you're not doing it right. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, is DST, is, is do they have a community garden? Yeah, these, this is, 18 Broadway is DST property. Yep, that's funded by DST, and they have another garden, actually. They used to have two more, but now they only have one more. Other question? Great, great question. Great. I see a lot of community gardens, and they seem to fall apart at the end of the season. You see a lot of fruit on the vines, and obviously you have people running their own plots and everything, but some of them I know get a lot of donations going. Right. I know others have had problems, and some cities are different than others. What are some of those? There's actually federal legislation that protects people who grow and donate fresh fruit and vegetables. So... Uh, no, you, nope, 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 you, you can, you can, 
I don't even think you have to, to demonstrate. Uh, Maybe that starts to get a little scary. Look, I understand. And, and people, people do. People, this, is why I, this is why I know this, because people start to, to wonder whether or not they could get sued for donating food to a pantry that winds up being contaminated and, and, and could get people sick. And the answer is you, they're not. They're not able to be prosecuted because there's legislation that exists that protects them. I do not remember the name of the bill, but the bill is 20 years old or so. Did you say it's on the federal level? That's right. What about on the local level? What are some things that you may have come across? Anything? I've never seen an instance where somebody who was the recipient of a food donation, fresh fruit and vegetable, locally produced, uh, that ever had any issue whatsoever. Now, they may very well say, Boy, you should have got here a little bit earlier because the lettuce is all wilted. We're just going to compost it. That probably happens. But from a foodborne illness standpoint, I haven't seen it. Okay. I suppose that's what you're alluding to. Other questions? Yes? Not really a question, but I know a year or two ago, someone started an organization here in town to glean right. produce. Yeah, them. yeah. So that's worth mentioning. So the Society of St. Andrews exists. Yeah, at Harvesters, actually. That's where their office is. Oh, okay. So yeah, if you're a producer or if you have a huge garden and you got a lot of stuff you can't, you don't know what to do with, you can call them. They'll come and get it and take it to harvesters. Question. Sure. So the Overland Park Arboretum? Yeah, to get them to grow, uh, let us pod get kids out there, and then give all the food to charity. I wouldn't say don't do it. I mean, if anything, I would just look at Powell Gardens as a good example, where before they were effectively almost strictly an ornamental demonstration uh, botanical garden. Um, and now a huge proportion of their business is because of the Heartland Harvest Garden, which is all food production. And now they're putting in a high tunnel for commercial tomato production. They actually hired somebody to, to do that. Uh, so that exists. I mean, that opportunity, I mean, at least the precedent has been set for such a place to turn into food production. There, that's the thing is there's a thousand different ways these things can sort of make, make themselves come about. Um, it's just got to be a win-win for everybody, you know. And, yeah, actually, people from the Arboretum. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, talk, just talk to them, I yeah, guess. Yeah, that's what I was, was there, there was a question over here? Yes. Okay, question. <laughs> Great, great. And just to take that to a metro-wide, uh, Kansas City Community Gardens also maintains such a list. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.